Everybody, welcome back to Northland. Oh, what the heck has happened? This was a, this is a terrible run I died on, right? Yeah, get me, get me out of here. I don't want to see this. You know what? New year, new me. It's not a new year, but uh, it's a new me. I'm back from Japan. It's right, L9AA1F24. Not really too interested in that. And I, there's so many different things conflicting simultaneously. You know, I haven't played Isaac in a while. Anecdote machines recharge. Starting on zero wins. It's a, it's a fresh start. Edmund announced the DLC is coming out at the end of this year. It's that we we're putting in the work. We're gonna be like exiting the hyperbolic time chamber that Malf always talks about. I never watched. To be honest, like some of Malf's Dragon Ball references, uh, I I don't understand because uh, you know when I was like 12, they started airing Dragon Ball Z on the on the kids network where I watch stuff, and I got really into it. And like, you know, Piccolo Saga, Vegeta Saga is great stuff. Frieza Saga, probably the most classic Dragon Ball Z out there, maybe. Uh, but it, it, it did get to the point where it was like, uh -huh, uh -huh, you know, for like 30 episodes in a row. And then there was like a d delay with the rights or something in Canada. So for like a year and a half, there was just reruns of the Frieza Saga. And I just fell off, dude. Then later, you know, they brought the, the Cell Saga. I watched a couple episodes, but it just wasn't the same. Anyway, I'm saying by the time the DLC comes out, I'm going to be ready to go, brother. That's what I'm saying. Now, I got to, you know, right out of the gate. I'm... Jet lagged is not the right word for the way I'm feeling. I, I don't know how jet lagged I will be yet. I'll just, I, you know... Safe to assume I'll probably be a little jet lag. The time difference between uh, Vancouver and Tokyo is 16 hours. Might surprise you to hear this, but I actually feel like uh, a 16 hour time difference is, it's it's not easy, let me rephrase. Like I wouldn't say it's simple, but in its own weird way, it's almost just like an eight-hour shift, if that makes sense. Okay, I'm, I'm done with these items, please. You know what? Actually, I like this item, because teleport's also not that good. Um, what do I mean by that ridiculous statement? Here's what I mean. You know? You, when it's 8 a.m. in Tokyo, that means it's 4 p.m. in Vancouver. That's you know, means you're getting up in the afternoon. It's like you're constantly waking up from an afternoon nap and then, you know, pulling an all-nighter. It's like working third shift or something like that. Might sound ridiculous, but I actually think that I was more bothered by the jet lag when I went to Josh's wedding. Because, like, you know, if you're flying west, depending on the time that you land, usually you just gotta stay up later. You don't have to go to bed earlier. Because the flight's already, you know, crazy long. You're on the flight for nine hours. See if we get anything here. Okay, that's fine. Um, so all you gotta do, you know, you land, it's four in the afternoon. By the time you get to wherever you're staying, it's, it's gonna be six, maybe. And then, uh, you know, all you gotta do is stay up until eight, nine, ten. Ten p.m., you go to sleep, you wake up, and, and yeah, I wouldn't say you're good. You're, you, Three p.m. rolls around, you're gonna be like, I wanna die. But, you know, going to EST, from PST sometimes I think is even a little bit harder despite the fact that it's substantially shorter because you're okay you, you wake up at 4 a.m. you get on a 6 uh, a.m. plane you land in uh, the East Coast at like 4 p.m. eat dinner and then people are like all right time for bed and you're like, time for bed I just woke up going to bed when you're not tired is way more difficult for, for me and I think for most people than staying up when you're tired. You know, like, obviously when you get, like, insanely tired, it's impossible to stay awake, but if you're not tired at all, trying to fall asleep is, like, a unique form of torture. So, definitely we'll take this. I shouldn't. I, I, I really shouldn't. This is the only thing that could jeopardize the start of this run. Yeah, sorry, brother. Gonna grab 
Oh, it's, it's not even gonna kill you. Okay, never mind then. Never mind then. We'll go quickly check out our boss trap room. The stats are good. Everything's good about this run. Nothing's truly amazing, but, but the stats are fine. Yo, also pretty good. So yeah, I, I mean, I will be jet lagged to some extent, but jet lag usually doesn't get me too bad. You get a couple of bad days and then you just get over it. You know? Life goes on. I know you're like, why did I pick those up? <laughs> Dude, it, I'm tired. Let me give you a, a little span of my day. I mean, it's hard because it's like, it's Friday night. <clears throat> Vancouver time. And like, I woke up Friday morning, Tokyo time. So we like woke up, packed, checked out, got ready. Shopped for like three hours. Went to the airport. Let me go. Took a nine hour flight. That's like a, a whole day. Then we came home, took like a four hour nap, and then this is the third video I've recorded. So my brain's in like a foggy place. You're gonna have to allow me here, but it's been a long day, that's all I'm trying to say. My my Isaac Fu might not be where I would like it to be. That's okay, because here's a little dirty secret about Isaac. It's easy. <laughs> Even though I've lost a little bit recently, one of those losses was panic and deserved. The other loss was actually like, it was like Ed reached down from his game design platform and said, not this one, brother. You, you, no chance. It was impossible. I mean, it was not impossible. People have probably... Uh, done the seed, but it, it's certainly it's one of the more difficult ones I've ever had. Anyway, dude, what, it, it's hard to, when you got anecdotes, it's hard to spin into them, you know? Because you get, there's no natural way to, to just pivot from bit to bit. It's like a Jimmy Carr comedy special. You just kind of got to give away with the pretense of uh, segues. But I had a great time in Japan. Always nice to recharge. Sometimes when I come back from from being uh, just basically in a country where I don't speak the language, I'm happy to be back, um, and and that's true this time. But I'm all there's a melancholic feeling of like oh you know our vacation is over, but you know it's it's not the first time, it won't be the last time. But sometimes when I leave, uh, you know Japan in particular, because like we, we went to Korea last year, but in Korea you know I lived there, so I can kind of handle myself or at least. Maybe I'm just more tolerant of the embarrassment that I'm used to in, in South Korea, if that makes any sense. Because, like, inevitably, you know, there, there were situations in South Korea that... I, I think when... Let me rephrase, okay? Because I'm, I'm spinning my wheels here. My wife speaks Japanese fluently. So, when we go out to, like, a restaurant, she basically becomes, like, my caretaker, you know? They give us the menu, and I... You know, even if sometimes there's English in it, but I like, I'll point at it and be like, I would like that. Can you order that for me, please? And she's like, sure, I'll do it. She basically, she enables me, but I mean, I would do the same if, if, if I spoke a second language <laughs> that I could help her with. But, um, I guess I, I, if we went to like, uh, you know, French speaking country, I could at least read the menus and then embarrass myself on the order. But, um... You know, in in Korea, I didn't really have that luxury, you know? I moved there, I, I, I knew the alphabet, so you could sound some stuff out, but, you know, eventually, if you wanted to eat, you'd have to... You'd have to figure something out. You'd have to go to a restaurant and be like, you know, Shilla Hamnida, uh... Chamchi, Kimbap, Duge, Bojong, Juseo, Bali Bali, and then they would... You know, I, I think I told this story. I, I mean, I've told every story at this point, but, you know, one time I went into... Uh, my co-worker had asked me, he was like, hey, can you give me some chamchi kimbap when you're going to the store for yourself? Because I'm like, I'm swamped at my desk. I said, sure. So I went... Uh, chamchi kimbap, by the way, it's like a tuna... It's a tuna roll. Let's just call it that. Uh, I went into the restaurant. I was like, hey, Sheila, how many... Uh, that's like, excuse me. Uh... 
kimchi kimbap duge juiceo. That's my order. I'll take two kimchi kimbaps, no big deal. And then I went two jamchi kimbap juiceo. And then I swear to you, the whole friggin' restaurant started laughing. There were like 20 people sitting down. This includes the staff. And what do you do when, like, you're in a foreign country and everybody just starts laughing at you? You laugh back. It's a strange situation. It's like, you know, in Evil Dead 2 when all the furniture starts laughing at Ash. I didn't know what was going on. Anyway, they, they laughed and, well, I don't know what they said. But they were like, you know. I thought they said, repeat yourself. I don't know. Two chomchi came up, you say, oh. And they went like, okay, I get it. Apparently, turns out, for those of you not in the know on this joke, chomchi is... Tuna. Jamchi is uh, slang for a woman's you-know-what. So I basically went into the store and was like, Hey, I'll take two uh, normal foods and then also, <laughs> can I get a roll of your genitals? And, you know, in hindsight, and, and even like it, it at then sight, um, that's a funny situation, I can't deny. It's not that funny when it's you, but also, you just kind of, you know, you, you can't afford to be traumatized, because I mean, that was the restaurant that was closest to the school. If I didn't want to go in there again, you know, it was going to be a... It was going to inconvenience me to an enormous degree. So you just, uh, you know, it, it, I don't know, many people have probably had a similar situation, but like, you know, if you, uh... If you're in a, another country and you wanna, you wanna eat, or you wanna like you know get on a train, or you wanna pay a bill or something, like sometimes you just gotta open yourself up to embarrassment. Sometimes you gotta walk into the you know municipal tax office or the bank or something and just point to your face and be like, "Help me! I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like a lost child." <laughs> now, it's nice. Don't get me wrong. I'm very grateful that my wife's fluent Japanese allows me to experience. Uh, it, it makes the trip much more comfortable and also allows me to experience stuff I otherwise probably would not be able to experience because, you know, it, it, some of the stuff that we did, you know, if you want to go, you got to book it in advance. And the only way to book it in advance is on a website that's entirely in Japanese. So it's definitely better this way, but it has also made me soft. But, you know, it, it actually, I was, having a, I was having a good time. It's kind of nice to have all the burden of speaking to anybody in public taken off of you. Like, if something goes down in Vancouver, you know, maybe someone bumps into us in a train station or something. I gotta, you know, I'm expected to take the lead. Hey, buddy, watch where you're going. But in a in a country where I don't speak the language, I'm basically like a pet. <laughs> I'm like, uh, I'm like, uh, just an accessory going around. Every once in a while, you know, I, I, you never know how much of it is paranoia, too, you know? Just to be honest, because, uh... I know these anecdotes are not from Japan, but, it, it, you know, it's a compare and contrast sort of thing. I always feel, you know, I've lived 95% of my life in, like, 98% of my life in a country where I'm pretty much, like, I see me's everywhere I go. You know what I mean? Like, bald white guy in his 20s and 30s. It, it's, it's a pretty common aesthetic. So whenever, you know, and, and this happened when I lived in Korea, too, you'd catch people, like, looking at you. And then you'd have to run through the thought process in your head. And you'd be like, are they looking at me? Because they're like, never seen a guy like this, so, you know, this is a relatively small town, what are you doing here? Or, are they just looking at me because, like, come on, I'm gorgeous. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that, like, you know, a Caucasian male is one of a kind in Japan. Trust me, I was walking around in, in Tokyo. There's there's dozens of us, and everybody but me was wearing a shirt with a character from One Piece on it. I felt like I was very overdressed. Yo, we're guppy already. We haven't made the best purchase decisions here. I mean, I, why did I buy Bomber Boy? It's a great question. Um, it's a great question, indeed. Next question. But you just, you know, it starts to, it gets to be like, not paranoia, but, you know, you get inside your own head. You kind of see how it would be, you know, to not be the 
you know, default character type A number one in, in all video games, you, you know? Anyway. But there's nothing worse, and you know, my, my Japanese is so bad. My Korean is like, it's acceptable uh, for a foreigner, basically. It, it's bad, but I get complimented on it because a lot of people don't even make the effort to get to bad status. So, you know, I can ask for like a garbage bag at the convenience store. Chila, how many dots? Reggae, bang, two, juice, hell. And then people go, whoa! And I'm like, yeah, you know. I took out my own trash. <laughs> but in, in Japan, I only got like, literally I've got arigato gozaimash, which is not even the right way to pronounce it. Arigato gozaimash ta. And, uh, and I got, uh, I mean, konnichiwa is, uh, or you know, ohio. And I got, uh, I mean, that's basically it. I can't even ask for where the bathroom is. I should really learn, but again, I just get enabled. There's nothing worse, though, than, you know, you'll be at, like, a convenience store. And, you know, it, that's the thing, is, like, you get in your own head. Because I'm sure that, if anything, the staff at, like, a Japanese convenience store, they've had dumb idiots like me come in before and just, like, plop the stuff down on the table and be like, eh. <laughs> And then you wait for the money to, like, the number to pop up on the cash register and you pretend like you knew what was happening the whole interaction. And then, you, you know, you put the money in there and they, they say something and you go, okay, that must mean that that's not enough. And then you put more money in and they're like, they say something else and you're like, oh, never mind. That must mean that it was enough and now I've added too much. So you take some away and then they're, you know, yeah, that it happens. But anyway, um, there's nothing worse than, you know. You, you plop your stuff down at the convenience store, uh, because the convenience stores in Japan, the food is actually, like, pretty decent. So, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a snob sometimes, for sure, but, you know, it, go into the convenience store, get a couple, uh, you know, rice balls. Delicious. You plop them down on the counter, and then they say something, and you go, hi. And then they say something, and you go, hi. And then they say something, and you go, hi. And then, you know, you put the money in the little tray and they, they give you the change. When they give you the change, they look you dead in the eyes and say, thank you. <laughs> Excuse me, ma'am. I understand. How dare you just assume that I don't speak Japanese? Just because no matter what you say to me, I respond with a polite and breathy yes. That's just... Honestly, you should be ashamed, young lady. For trying to accommodate me. You mean I wasn't passing as a fluent Japanese speaker? It's a very dangerous position to be in. Again, if you find yourself in this situation, you, you'll relate to this heavily, I'm sure, but... Being in a country in which you don't speak the language, completing any transaction is a minefield. Because literally, you're only going to say yes. Because, I mean, at a convenience store... What are you going to say no to? Do you want a bag? Look, I'll eat the environmental cost of the bag. Because I don't know what bag is in cool. Japanese. So I, you got to do what you got to do. But they could be like, hey, can I have all your money? And you're just going to be like, hi. <laughs> uh, are you a big uh, poo-poo head who smells like his own poo-poo? Hi. Hi, that's me. I'm the poo-poo head. You know, they, you get, you're really relying on the kindness of strangers. They could, they could have you saying all sorts of terrible stuff and embarrassing yourself in public. I, I don't believe they would, because what do they get out of it except a cheap thrill, but... You know, there, there's nothing that... Uh, there's no barrier there. Like, if you went to a convenience store in Vancouver and you're paying for, like, a Coca-Cola, and the guy went, Hey, you want to, like, you know, can I sleep with your mom? I'd be like, excuse me, sir? I'm, a, I'm calling corporate. What's your name? If, if I went to, you know, 7-Eleven in Japan and they were like, Hey, can I sleep with your mom? I'd be like, <laughs> Hi. Hi. You, how many how many highs do I have to say to get this uh, to get this coffee into a plastic bag and then get out of this store with the adrenaline coursing through my veins? That's not to say you can't, you know, make do with English in Japan because at least in Tokyo you definitely can. But it always just, I don't know. It, again, in Korea, you just kind of you get over it because I lived there. You know, you, if you got no other option, you might as well at least throw a line out there and be like, uh. 
you know, French fries. And they're like, oh, and you're okay, thank you. Um, but it, it it just feels bad to resort to English. It's like I would I would like rather starve sometimes than come to a different country and be like, you know, y'all got any chicken karage? <laughs> rather just point to like a number on the menu and then hand them twenty dollars and just you know. Let let the Lord figure out where this one's gonna shake out. Am I gonna be eating lunch? Did I just put a down payment on a car? I don't know. Now we did do something really cool in Japan. We went to this place. I mean, we've been many times, so like, it's not meant to be braggadocious. But some days we're like, "What do you want to do today?" And then I like look up, you know, the top 100 things to do in Tokyo. We've done like 89 of them. So like, you know, we don't really need the. I don't need to see Tokyo Tower again. It's it's beautiful. Tokyo Sky Three is beautiful, but you don't need. To, this is the kind of stuff you don't have to do every time. You know, you just relax a little bit. Um, but we did one cool uh, semi touristy thing. Is a, a digital art museum called Team Lab Borderless. It's one of the coolest. I mean, it, <clears throat> I don't know whether you call it a gallery museum. It's kind of like if you've ever been to. You know, a, a science center where they have, like, you know, cool experiments where, like, you know, you can see the blood vessels inside of your own eyes. It's like that, but um, for art. And, it, you know, so you walk in and there's, like, it's it's a digital art museum. So it's not like you're, like, necessarily looking at, at paintings and stuff like that. But you walk in and this is a good example. There's a room and uh, if you stand still in the room, there's, there's a series of, like, projectors and... Uh, and, and, and cameras and, and lights and stuff like that. If you stand still, uh, these like chrysalids start to appear on your body, like the images of chrysalids. And then they'll like gradually fall off. And when they hit the ground, they become butterflies that fly like along the floor and along the walls. It's really cool. You can watch them spread out. But the thing is, if the butterflies collide with anything, like another person's feet, for example, when they're on the floor, they get destroyed. So it's it's a the kind of like installation that really makes you think. You're like, you know, here's uh you know, I'm creating life. And that the way that it works is that the reason it's called borderless is because, you know, just because you're in the butterfly room, that doesn't mean there's not butterflies throughout the rest of the museum. You know, it's kinda like free flowing. They can stay in that room, they could leave that room, fly around on the ceiling, you know, two floors up. Let's check out our angel room here. Let's just uh, get... Let's, let's get weird, mama. So, you know, whenever you see a butterfly, even if it's been like an hour and a half, you're like, yo, dude, all the butterflies in this entire museum were spawned in that little room right at the very uh, entrance. Isn't that interesting? You also... And I, I mean, I think it's interesting. Uh, but you also... Uh, you, you learn a lot about human nature. Because you know, there's a lot of kids in that museum. A lot of adults as well, but a lot of kids. So Kate and I were in the room, spawning some butterflies, and I was like, yo, this is really cool. And then I would say maybe 60% of the population, three out of five people, their first reaction when they see something moving on the ground, not an insect, but like clearly a, a projection, is to just stomp on it. And I know you're like, I doubt it. I did it for like probably 15 minutes. And kids, it's 100%. Kids, will, they see something moving, they go, yeah, 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 yeah. I get it, okay? They want to interact with the world. You know, when you're a kid, you don't have that much uh, impact. <clears throat> Sorry, getting a little hoarse here. Um, you don't have that much impact on the world. Just to be able to affect anything is a luxury. People are like, why are you treating me like a kid? You know, like my, my impact is inconsequential. Um, so I, I don't blame the kids. Plus, it's like a video game, you know, when you're... At that age, what do you do when you see something on a screen? Just tap it. <laughs> tap, skip ad. Tap, uh, you know, kill all the drones. T tap on the candy. You know, I get it. We, we tailored a, a generation to when they see a digital creature, just touch it and see what happens. Um, but a lot of adults, they would read the exhibit uh, description. So they'd be informed of what happens when you step on the butterflies. And they're well within their right to step on the butterflies. But, you know, as soon as they read it, they went, oh. And then they would, like, just walk around to somebody, just a stranger who spawned, uh, maybe it's me, maybe I spawned 30 butterflies. 
And uh, they just, like, basically look at me dead in the face and then just step on all of them. And I thought it was a great metaphor for... Not even a metaphor, it's extremely on the nose uh, about human nature. There's another part of the museum is really... I would really recommend going if you go to Tokyo. The only thing I will say is go early. Be there when it opens and buy your tickets in advance because it was absurdly busy. But... Um, there's another part, and it's really like a kid's part of the museum, but as someone who didn't speak Japanese in Japan, I'm basically at the mental level of like a five-year-old, so it was the right area for me to be in. Um, that's how people treated me anyway. Uh, so there's a part where like, okay, so you go into this room, and uh, you know, again, it's the projections on the walls and on the ground. There's a few different kinds of animals, you know, there's, uh, well, there's flowers, which are not animals, so I'll, I'll acquiesce on that one. Uh, but there's flowers, there's frogs, there's birds, there's lizards, there's crocodiles. And the way that things work is you can grab, like, uh, an outline of an animal, or a flower, if you want to be pedantic. But who's picking the flower, dude? And, uh, then you can go and you can color it in. And after you're finished coloring it in however you choose, you can scan it. And when you scan it, it actually gets instanced into the museum itself and it interacts with everybody else's drawings so there's like certain rules like i was drawing a crocodile crocodiles like they eat birds and don't get eaten by anything they're a an apex predator in the ecosystem but if too many people step on them they'll die and uh you know if they eat lizards they uh they start to multiply. So, you, you know, if you watch it for a bit, you can see, like, trends. Like, a creature will come out into the ecosystem, and, you know, it'll just happen to be really good at killing birds somehow. And then it'll, you know, kill a bunch of birds. And then, before you know it, like, you know, 50% of the croc population is all one dude who wrote, like, Jim on the side of his, his crocodile. So, Kate and I, I mean, we spent, like, half an hour, 40 minutes. I was making a crocodile. She was making a lizard. Scan it in. I thought I had a really genius idea. If you haven't seen my tweet, you know, my genius idea is, okay, crocodiles eat um, birds. Birds eat lizards. So I drew a crocodile, and then I tried to put a little lizard pattern on its back so that the birds, if the algorithm was, you know, if it functioned on that sort of criteria, it would look at my croc and be like, dude, that's a juicy lizard. And then when it got close, hunk, bio major. You know? Anyway, so I was all excited. I was like, this is going to be so cool. My crocodile is going to dominate here. It's not really fair. I mean, I have a, a bachelor's of science. <laughs> Most of the other people in this ecosystem, you know, haven't even finished uh, second grade yet. Anyway, scanned in my crocodile. Immediately after it getting scanned in, it did live for, for like five minutes. So I don't, I don't want to bury the lead too much here, but immediately after it spawned in, like a, a kindergarten age Japanese child just saw it and jumped on its head like 10 times. Just boom, 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 boom. And just the whole time, I mean, it's not that uh, sophisticated, you know, like uh, it, it, it's just getting smushed and like a little bit of blood is coming out of it. And well, a little bit of goo at least. And I was like, dude, this is... First off, it's hilarious. Secondly, I actually felt like a child was being ripped from me in that moment. Now, I mean, I obviously wasn't quite to that, you know, visceral Tony Collette level. But, like, dude, I was... I mean, I wasn't upset, but I was like, this is... It's modestly traumatic. I spent half an hour making that thing you have the audacity to just jump on it i would say you know the uh, the idea was when you leave the museum you, you you've kind of meditated on or, or thought about the idea that you know like and i don't know i'm not much of a, a new age free spirit sort of thinker as you can probably imagine more of like an alex p keaton sort of you know uh begrudging capitalist sort of guy but for the most part you know, you're supposed to leave and you're supposed to be like, man, it's really wild how the museum really uh, puts it into perspective how, like, you know, uh, although we consider ourselves a distinct entity from nature, we really, you know, we are nature. You know, we, we are made of plant matter and, and lizard matter and chicken matter and corn matter, you know? Like, and, you know, every, every piece of 
energy that, that we've ever synthesized, every quanta, you know, had, had its own story as well. You know, uh, that grass-fed beef, if you're eating that, you know, the cow had a life, it, it spawned in. The grass that it ate, you know, germinated there from somewhere and, and grew as well. And, you know, we're all interconnected in its own way. And so that was, like, one beautiful, like, moment that I had while I was at the museum. And then the other moment was just constantly remembering that anytime anything got created in the world, a bunch of people just immediately sought it out and destroyed it. And I was like, this is, even like Zack Snyder would be like, this is a little heavy handed, guys, but I saw it, dude. I don't blame the kids, I do blame the adults. To some, like there, they, honestly, there are a lot of great metaphors there that I can't get into really without being extremely pretentious. But like I was spawning butterflies in the room and then like a lady looked at me and she looked at the butterflies like popping off of my body and then she said something you know that was not in english to her companion and then she staged like an instagram photo with her companion and the whole time she was taking the instagram photo it took like 45 seconds just endless streams of butterflies pouring off of my body and right into her shoes <laughs> just me and and they're just going like wow this is incredible. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you guys have enjoyed the episode. If you did, click the like button. It helps a great deal. Of course, subscribe if you want to see more in the future. For now, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. See ya!